Welcome to Startup Health Now, the weekly web show that celebrates the healthcare transformers and change makers reimagining health. My name is Unity Stokes, and today we are at the Wearable Tech and Digital Health Conference in San Francisco. We've got a very special guest, Dr. Keith Black, who is the chairman and professor of neurosurgery at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Uh, we're gonna have a very uh, deep conversation about what it's like to be a doctor or doctorpreneur innovating today in healthcare. Stick around, it's gonna be a great show. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. Well, I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. To those who take uh, we're with Dr. Keith Black here. Um, I thought we'd start the conversation really by learning about you, um, your backstory, um, and and really how you got into health and healthcare uh, at the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, as as long as I can remember, when I was a little kid, I've always had a fascination for science, trying to understand uh, what was the process of life. Um, I knew that I will always go go into science and. Uh, and I fell in love, I think, with the biological side of it and uh, ultimately uh, in, in medicine because I wanted to apply what I knew in science to patients and to be able to treat patients. So, you know, that's kind of the condensed story. Um, I, was, um, I was very uh, aggressive uh, when I was in junior high and high school and knocking down doors and trying to, you know, get exposure in, into research labs and I got into a research lab actually in about the ninth and uh, tenth grade and started working with a heart surgeon that had developed his own heart valve and uh, convinced him to let me do my own project and um, uh, in patients undergoing heart lung bypass I identified a, a, a blood damage that occurred and published that uh, when I was 17 as my first scientific paper. There's, there's such a valuable lesson there. You, it sounds like you proactively took the initiative even, even very early, you said yeah. ninth, 10th grade. Yeah. Um, I think too few people do that today. What would your advice be even to young students yeah. who have that kind of drive, have that passion? How, what should they be doing to try to set themselves on, on the same path? Well, I think, you know, the first conversation really should go to the parents, right? Because I was very fortunate in that both my father and mother were educators and they saw that I had a passion for science. They saw I had a had a passion for trying to understand you know, this whole process. So they created an environment and nourished that in me. So I think that's really the most important thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the other is that once you find what you love and what you like, then you know, be aggressive at it, right? It's, I always, when I'm talking to students, I say it's like trying to get the girl on a date. You know, you may get turned down on a lot of dates, but eventually you're gonna get one. And that may just work Persistence. out you know, really well. So you have to be, you have to be persistent, and you have to not worry about failure, right? Because failure is just a part of part of this process that we're living. Uh, but uh, which, with each failure, you learn something, you get a little better, and ultimately, you're likely to have some success. And and uh, your your personal mission. What what are you most passionate about today? As you think about your journey and 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 how you've shaped your career, but really how you're spending your time and, and what you care most deeply about. For for most of my you know career, I've, I've, I was focused on uh, brain tumors, uh, particularly uh, primary malignant tumors. Uh, now uh, uh, I've expanded that. Uh, focus to also include cognitive decline with aging. Um, you know, the fact that we're living longer, our bodies are really designed to outlast our brains. Uh, and so we're seeing people live longer than we ever have in human history. The, the, the downside of that is that by the time we get 85 and older, 47% of us will have Alzheimer's or some type of dementia. So one of the big health challenges is trying to find a solution to that. And I think as we understand the biology of the aging brain, what happens, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to try to reverse it. 
Uh, I think it's a process that actually occurs over a long period of time, a couple of decades. So the opportunity... So regeneration... Well, not necessarily regeneration, but I think more prevention. Okay. Right? So if we can identify the decline early and prevent that decline, we have a, an opportunity to, to extend cognitive performance for our, for our population to a much later point in life. So what are you most excited about today then we're you know we're we're at this wearables tech digital health conference there's a lot of extraordinary new technology mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of focus on the brain yeah. now for different reasons mm -hmm. um, what are you personally most excited about what you're seeing and where you think we are yeah. in terms of where the science is and where the opportunity is so I think if, if we talk about the field in general the paradigm for medicine and healthcare is beginning to shift so when I went to medical school, it was all about, you know, identifying a, a disease and treating that disease. Now the focus is on predicting the occurrence of that disease and preventing that disease from occurring. So we have so much data now that we're trying to understand how to basically harness that data to predict what disorders we're going to get a year from now, five years, 10, 20 years from now. So if you can predict the disease before it occurs, we have a much better opportunity of, of having a successful therapeutic intervention or preventing that disease from occurring. So I think the biggest shift that we're going to see is that uh, the next generation of healthcare providers are going to be more trained on preventing disease than in treating disease. That's a complete shift, really, and it has significant implications. Um, it seems as though a lot of the innovation today is focused specifically on the on the U.S. market. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of the implications of what we're talking about for the global market? Um, and you know, there's 7.5 billion people in the world. Um, a lot of health challenges around the world. Um, how, how, how will things impact and, and help, hopefully, people around the world as well? So, you know, healthcare in the United States is very expensive. We have a lot of regulation. Um, uh, prices are very high. Uh, the, uh, the price points that we pay healthcare professionals for delivering that care is very high. So it's not a model that can be easily transported to countries where the economics are very different than the United States or other Western countries. Uh, but I think uh, the paradigm is shifting in that with the technology that's available, it's not expensive technology. Of course, the cost it's, can come close to zero in right. some cases. I mean, and, and so, you know, the acquiring the data, the sensors, the microchips, the things that are being utilized are, are really inexpensive and they're getting less expensive. So we're going to see the ability to provide those services at a fraction of the cost. And it's going to be very disruptive for the U.S. because it's going to be hard right, to continue that cost disparity uh, without justification for, for, for quality and outcomes. Yeah, the analogy I've used is I, I remember when uh, medication or uh, the cost of medication for HIV was let's say $100 per, per pill and then at one point they were able to bring the cost down to a few pennies right. um, in, in Africa and it, it seemed like there's a powerful lesson there in terms of almost reverse engineering the business models at, at scale and, and exciting innovation taking right. place around the world that will then one day come back and, and help us here and really bring the cost down. Exactly right. And so, you know, and, and also we're paying for all of the failures that occur, right? So for that one pill that successfully got through the right. FDA and got approved, there were 500 that failed and so we have to pay for all of those failures and the, the R&D that makes that work. So hopefully we will understand a paradigm, particularly as we get smarter and using um, much better uh, technology and computers to try to design future therapeutics, we will drive that cost down, right? Because we want to continue to innovate. We have to pay for that innovation somehow, uh, but we have to figure out a way to amortize that innovation. Um, one of the things I think that the internet revolution uh, has done is that it's democratized knowledge. So, you know, there are millions of really brilliant people in India. There are millions of brilliant people in China and in Africa. And those individuals are also making discoveries and making technologies that are going to impact it. So we 
are not going to be the only ones here doing it in a very expensive environment, but you're going to have you know, the same knowledge base accessible to a lot of people that are going to be trying to innovate, which I think will drive down the cost. So that's extraordinary. Um, paint a picture of the future from, from your perspective. We've talked about some big issues, aging population we're here in the U.S. and other places around the world starting to live longer, um, but there's also challenges, right. um, you know, perhaps increase Alzheimer's or other, other issues. Yeah. Is it an optimistic future? What's, what's your take on the predictions of, of how things are evolving if we're living to be 150? Well, I, I tell you, you know, they say that people that predict the future live in small houses. Okay. Right? <laughs> so it's very difficult. I, what, what I will say is that I've always been amazed at uh, the ability of us as a, as a species to figure out solutions, um, you, you know. When I was growing up uh, as a young child and we were practicing for nuclear uh, war drills and hiding under the desk, you know, I said, God, if I could just make it till I'm 48 years old, somehow we managed to survive. Somehow we managed to contain all of that. Now, we have a lot of challenges today. Uh, we have um, uh, environmental challenges. We have challenges, you know, with, with terrorists um, uh, disrupting society. Uh, we have challenges with overpopulation, right? And so as our science drives the population to live longer, consume more resources, we also have to have a parallel science to make sure that we're in balance with our environment. So as we uh, allow ourselves to live longer, we have to also learn how to mm -hmm. consume less mm -hmm. and have less of a footprint on the environment and hopefully that science will go in parallel, right? So. You know, that's the only way that we're going we're gonna to ultimately survive. So, a couple of last questions here. We'd love to learn um, any technology, apps, things that you find yourself uh, recommending, using all the time, um, in particular that, that impact uh, things that you care most deeply about. So, in, you know, it's interesting because um, I'm, I'm very interested in wearable technology because I know that lifestyle modification can have a huge impact on one's health. And so I've been wearing a lot of apps, you know, looking at the technology, you know, monitoring my body fat and heart rate and how many steps and how many calories I burn uh, and the quality of food that I'm eating. It's interesting, what I've noticed is that after a certain point, it, it's taught me what it can teach me and I'll stop using the app because I can predict in my mind was it was a so kickstarter for you. It was a kickstart. So I'm looking for sort of the next generation, right? What's after that? Um, and I think that um, we've seen the first wave. Um, I think what the future will hold is that, you know, we're going to have big data. That's all of our apps will somehow be combined. And it's going to be predicting, wait a minute, you know, your blood pressure is getting a little high. You know, here are things that you need to do or, you know, you're at risk of getting you know, colon cancer, go to your doctor and get a colonoscopy, you know, before it's time. So, I mean, those are the kind of predictions I think that we're looking forward to. Uh, one of the uh, technologies that we're working on in a, in a company that um, I'm a director of is the ability to look through the eye and identify the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease uh, potentially a lot earlier uh, non-invasively. Non-invasively with a 10-minute eye test like you would get at your eye doctor. Can you say the name of the company? Yeah, the company is called uh, Neurovision. Neurovision. And essentially the, the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, one of the earliest hallmarks, is the, is the occurrence of these A-beta amyloid plaques that occur in the brain. The back of the eye, the retina, is an extension of the brain and we've been able to identify these plaques in the retina and we're looking at the correlation between the onset of plaques in the retina and the brain. So potentially you could have a non-invasive way of identifying the pathological onset of Alzheimer's disease 20 years before someone becomes symptomatic, before you lose your brain cells, before you lose the connectivity. And so we're trying to understand how do we integrate that technology as a widespread screening test for individuals that are in the process of developing the disease. And what's very interesting about this conference then is what do you do about it, right? So on the know, prevention on side. On the prevention side. So we know that lifestyle has a 
impact potentially on the progression of the disease. So can we teach people to modify uh, their nutrition, go more towards the Mediterranean diet, mind diet, exercise better, sleep be better, reduce stress, and what's the ultimate impact of that, right? And so being able to integrate all of this data, all of this technology, and understand the impact of that. So I, I just want to dig into something you just said. Um, so this would be for everyone out there, some of those recommendations on, you mentioned Mediterranean diet, sleep. Right. Um, what could or should people be doing to take care of their health yeah. anyway, proactively, right. before they even have access to one of these diagnostics or tests that will help their brain long term? So we know, um, for example, that um, uh, lifestyle can have an impact. So a lot of the studies are beginning to uh, suggest that diet can modify the progression of the disease, particularly the Mediterranean diet, you know, high in fish, high in nuts, high in fruits, um, uh, and probably even the mind diet, uh, which is a little less salt, you know, than the Mediterranean diet. Um, we know that exercise can be very important for brain health. Uh, the opportunity to get more sleep. When I was in medical school, I thought it was really macho to get by with two hours of sleep a night. Really bad for the brain. Mm -hmm. You know, your optimal sleep is probably closer to seven or eight hours. Uh, learning how to uh, modulate your stress, you know, and whether that's through meditation or other sort of mindful exercises, all of those things can be, you know, potentially very important. Well, thank you so much for everything that you do and for sharing your time and wisdom with, with the ecosystem today. It's a, it's a big honor. Thank oh, it's you. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you soon.